Hey there, this is Dr. Evan Osar, founder of Fitness Education Seminars, the movement-based solution to the healthcare crisis, and author of the Corrective Exercise Solutions to Common Hip and Shoulder Dysfunction. Thank you so much for tuning into this webinar on the Corrective Exercise Strategies for Solving Low Back Pain. So what are the goals of this webinar? One is we want to understand the primary cause of low back pain in our clients. Two, to understand how inefficient posture and movement strategies relate to low back pain. And three, and most importantly, how do we develop the corrective exercise strategies that are going to help our clients solve their low back pain? So we become that fitness professional that our clients need, want, and will pay for. And most importantly, we'll refer their friends and family to as well for our expertise. We know that low back pain is a worldwide epidemic. It's the most common cause of disability in the UK in young adults, and over 28 million, 20 to 100 million workdays are lost every year in Sweden and UK. And those numbers are very similar here in the United States as well. And over $100 billion is spent just treating low back pain alone in the USA. And that doesn't even count all the side effects of failed low back surgeries and side effects from medications and things like that. The key to solving low back pain is to understand your role as a fitness professional. You know that clients come to us with specific goals. One, they want to feel better. Two, they often want to look better. However, a lot of our clients are coming to us with pain and dysfunction. So those are our clients' goals. So we have to somehow try to marry their goals to feel better, to look better, and with what they need, which is to deal with their pain and dysfunction so that they can accomplish their health and fitness goals. And that's what this webinar is all about, is helping you develop the strategies so you can best help your clients achieve what they want and add in a little bit of what they need so they not only can look and feel better, but they can actually function better inside their bodies. So let's get started. So why so much low back pain? And if we look at a quote from the Bulletin of the World Health Organization in 2003, they state in this paper that a minority of cases of back pain actually result from physical causes. And what this means is very few cases of low back pain are actually caused because of injuries like falls and traumas and surgeries, direct, direct low back pain. So what, does re what really causes most of the low back pain in our clients? Well, the majority of the cases of low back pain result from our clients' habits, their posture and their movement habits, how they're standing, how they're sitting, how they're bending, how they're lifting, how they're walking, essentially how they're living inside their bodies. So we want to change low back pain and deal with low back pain in our clients, we have to deal with the first deal with our clients' habits. How they move, how they stand, how they carry this, themselves in their bodies. So what underlies our habits? Oftentimes, it's a loss of an optimal level of control. What do we mean, mean by a loss of optimal levels of control? Here's a client of mine that's a young, healthy individual, no history of trauma, plays soccer one time a week, sits at a desk for a living, has chronic low back pain when he stands and when he, when he walks for long periods of time, over an hour. Look at the huge amount of erector tone he has in his thoracolumbar erector. Again, way too much tone for somebody that doesn't lift weights and isn't very physically active, is just active one day a week playing soccer. Why does he have so much tone? Well, we have to look at his habits. What does he do when, he, when his brain is asking his body to function? Well, let's look at a common assessment we use when we're assessing our clients with low back pain, especially if they have pain when they're standing and or walking. We're going to look at how they lose efficiency. We're going to see that an individual strategy is not efficient for the task at hand. And this client in particular, as we're going to see when he stands on one leg, look at the huge amount of erected tone that this client develops just to stand on one leg. So what we want to think about is Ask her, the question we want to ask ourselves, is this strategy efficient for the task that this client is performing? Is that going to be a very efficient strategy for this client to be standing, walking, and eventually playing soccer in? No, not at all. It's too much tone. It's too much activity for the simple activity of standing there and or walking. That's why he develops so much hypertonicity. That's why the muscles have to work so much. That's why what eventually leads to him developing low back pain, whether it be a disc problem, whether it be a facet problem, whether it be a myofascial problem, whether it be an inflammatory issue. The actual cause of the pain is less important than the strategy this client is using. The medical field wants to focus in on diagnosis. That's why they'll do x-rays and MRIs because they're looking for that 
thing that's causing the low back pain. What we want to do as fitness professionals is not focus on the thing that's causing pain, but look at the strategy our clients are using to stand and to move because that's what's leading to the disc problems, that's what's leading to the joint and facet problems, that's what's leading to the myofascial problems, and that's what's leading to the inflammation. It's what our clients are doing when they stand, when they move, when they breathe, how they lift, how they carry out their activities of daily living. And those are things that we can dramatically affect and directly affect as fitness professionals if you understand these key concepts. So when we talk about strategy, we're going to talk about effective versus efficient. Effective, what we're really re referring to is doing the right things. Most individuals are doing effective exercises. They're doing their core strengthening exercises. They're doing planks and chops and, and lifts and crunches and, and, and hyperextensions. They're doing all the things they need to do. They're being effective at strengthening the core. But with all the core strengthening we, we've seen over the years, we don't see any decrease in the amount of back pain. In fact, if anything, it's creating more and more dysfunction in our clients because they're not developing an efficient strategy. They're effective, but they're not being efficient. So what do we mean when we say efficient? What we mean by efficient is doing things right. So when you do your plank patterns, when you do your roll-up patterns, when you do your hyperextension patterns, are you doing them with the right amount of control? And are you doing the right exercises with the right clientele because there's some clients that can benefit from roll-up exercises and there's other clients that will actually harm them if you do roll-up exercises. Vice versa, there's some clients that they'll benefit from doing hyperextension or back extension work where other clients it actually creates more problems. So we want to make sure that not only are we doing the right things but how we're doing the exercises are efficient. And here's another example of what, what I mean by the difference between effective versus efficient. And remember, efficiency is not just about strength. Otherwise, every strong athlete and every strong individual would never have low back pain. But we see that lots and lots of clients and patients in our office that come in and they're very strong and capable individuals. They're just not efficient in how they're doing it. So we, here's a great example of effective versus efficient. This client to the left can do tens of 20s, 30s, 40, 50 push-ups, no problems. But how efficient is that posture? Now compare that plank position to my niece here, my three-year-old niece in this image here. Which one of these individuals has a more efficient plank type posture? You look at this client to the left, he looks like a lot of our clients, especially as they start to get fatigued. They have this sort of sway back posture, they have increased kyphosis, hyperextension in the neck. They do not have good control or efficient control of their posture. Whereas my niece here has a nice long spine, has good scapular control, has good intra-abdominal pressure, and she's supported very well over her four, her upper and lower extremities. This client here, scaps the wing, hyperextension, sagging abdominal wall. Very inefficient strategy. But it's not just our general population clients that have issues. Look at these two high-level professional athletes, Rafael Nadal on the left and Roger Federer on the right. Both athletes are highly effective. In fact, you can ignore actually argue that Nadal is actually a little more effective than Federer if you're looking at just wins alone. But which one, which one of their strategies for hitting a, a forehand shot is more efficient? And you can tell by looking at Federer that he's lined up over top his base of support. So if you look at his thorax, over top his pelvis, over top his foot, very well lined up. Head, trunk, pelvis lined up over top his leg. Nadal? hitting all with arms, sitting back on his heels, knees flexion, you see these knee wraps he has. Very arm dominant type stroke. Roger Federer using a much more efficient whole kinetic chain system to hit the ball. Much more efficient, rotates on an axis. That's what we're talking about when we talk about effective versus efficient. People can be very effective, but again, Nadal suffers from many more injuries than Federer does. Very effective at what he does, but has more injuries. And that's what we're talking about especially when it comes to our general population clientele, that we want to help our clients develop a more efficient strategy for controlling their low back than just becoming effective and doing effective exercises. And that's what we're going to cover in this webinar. So efficiency is all about having a good control strategy. And just think about a soda can. When the top is on, on a soda can, the, top, the can is stable. The pressure inside the can is such that you could stand on the can and the can would not crush. 
That's how these women, these relatively thin, frail women, can carry huge and massive loads on top of their head without creating any neck or spinal type problems because they have a very efficient control strategy. They're able to use intra-abdominal, intra-thoracic pressure. They're able to layer on top their myofascial slings, but they're able to stack their body over top of each other so they don't have to overuse, myo overuse their myofascial system to control these heavy loads. Now think about our clients or think about yourself. What would happen if you put, or I put, a big load of rocks on top of our head? We would be crushed very easily and very quickly because our strategy is not as efficient as these women's strategies. And here's what it looks like when you're not efficient. So once you pop the can at the, at the top of that soda can, now this can is very easily crushed. You can actually crush it in your hands. It's, it's so, so, so flimsy. And that's what happens when, when clients are using an inefficient strategy for stabilization. You see my client here that looks like a lot of our older clientele. Forward head, increased cervical uh, lordosis, increased thoracic kyphosis, increased lumbar lordosis. He's basically being crushed under the gravity and the pull of his muscle system. Again, we can do all, all great core exercises with him, planks and roll-ups and, and pillars and things like that, but if he doesn't develop a better strategy for controlling his body, all those exercises will make him stronger They'll be effective, but they'll actually break him down because his strategy is inefficient. And when you put more strength on top of inefficiency, you just get a more inefficient system. And that's why core exercises will oftentimes break our clients down and are counterproductive for a lot of our clients if you do not develop a more efficient strategy. So again, when we have efficient postural and movement strategy, we're able to suspend our body and stack our body and put stress on the joints where it belongs. And when we don't, like my client in the image to the right, then we'll start to succumb to the weight of gravity, the pull of our muscles, and any external loads or resistance that we put on top of our body. And that's why a lot of our clients, even though, though they may not work out very hard or very often, they feel very fatigued at the end of the day because their muscles are working way too hard to try to maintain the upright position. These women would never be able to carry these large loads of rocks on their head if they ever had a posture like my client in the image to the right. So our goal as fitness professionals is to help our clients develop a more efficient strategy. So how do we create a more efficient strategy? And again, we're going to look at specifically the role of the thoracic pelvic canister. We're going to look at the A, B, C, D, E's, the anatomy, the biomechanics, the control, what happens when it becomes dysfunctional, and then how do we execute the principles to increase efficiency. So the anatomy of the thoracic pelvic canister, what we're talking about is the thorax over top of the pelvis. The head should align over the thoracic pelvic canister, but the thorax, we want the thorax lined up over top of the pelvis with the pelvis underneath the thorax. So it forms a sort of canister, a flexible but able to be rigid canister. So it's flexible when, it needs, when we need to move, but it has ability to stay rigid when we need it to load. So the myofascial system of the thoracic pelvic canister is key to developing both the mobility as well as the stability we need to function in an efficient manner. So the deep myofascial system, again, these are the deep muscles, the transverse abdominis, the diaphragm, the pelvic floor, the multifidi, all those deep, small muscles that connect segment to segment. They're deep and they develop the local stability and fine movement. And what this means is they basically set the stage for the bigger muscles to work. They control the joints. They control the right amount of pressure around the joints, as well as they control the pressure inside the thorax and inside the abdominal cavities so that we have that intra-abdominal pressure that we need to create proper control. And then the superficial myofascial fascial systems, these are the large muscles that blend together to create these chains of muscles like the anterior and posterior oblique chains, as well as the, the anterior and posterior uh, longitudinal slings. These are the big muscles and they control large movement and growth stability. So these are the muscles that kick on when we need to accelerate or decelerate, when we need to lift heavy loads. So these two systems of muscles, the deep myofascial system, work together with a superficial myofascial system to create efficiency. When one system dominates or one system is inhibited, that's where we have to, have to start to create compensations. That's when our clients start to develop those chronic tightnesses and pains because they're overutilizing certain areas or certain aspects of the myofascial system. And technically, Usually, I should say usually, the superficial myofascial system becomes overactive and the deep myofascial system becomes inhibited. So that's where, again, we have a lot of, lot of the chronic tightnesses. And that's why our clients have so much need to stretch because they're trying to release the chronic tightness of the body, trying to create stability or a more efficient strategy. 
So a deep myofascial system is again composed of those deep muscles, diaphragm, pelvic floor, transverse abdominis, those muscles in between uh, the intercostals, the muscles in between the spine, and the superficial myofascial systems are the one muscles more on the surface, the ones that are more linked together in these myofascial chains or these myofascial slings. But we need both systems to be functioning optimally. So most of the mobility of the spine, as we know, comes from the thorax. We have over 130 joints in the thorax alone. So yes, we need a lot of mobility. But when we have where we have the need for mobility, like the thorax or like the feet, we also have a need for control. And just because a client has mobility doesn't mean they're controlling it. So we have to teach them not only how to create movement and have optimal movement, but we must teach them how to control that. So we're going to talk about how to control movement of the thorax as well. So we must be able to have both the role of, st of stability as well as mobility to have optimal back health. Mobility is important because it allows for breathing and expansion of the ribcage as well as rotation, as well as side bending, flexion, extension. Stability allows for lifting and the development of power. So think about somebody striking a tennis ball. To wind up, we need the ability to create mobility, mobility and the motion of rotation. As we swing the racket and we strike the ball, all of a sudden for that split second, we need the spine, trunk and spine, the thoracopelvic canister to be solid. We want to create the solid base so now we can drive that ball forward. So accelerate that ball forward, accelerate our arm forward, accelerate that ball forward. So we have a dual role, mobility to get into position, mobility to swing that racket, but then that stability, that rigidness to create an optimal acceleration and or deceleration of a load. And that's again what our clients need when they lift. They need a lot of stability to lift a load overhead, to do a kettlebell swing, to do a barbell squat, to do a step up. However, it's when they have too much stability and not enough in internal or local type control of our joints that our clients tend to get into trouble. Especially like the client I showed you earlier, that that hypertonicity of his lumbar erectors, he had too much stability in his low back, not enough control, internal control that allowed him to use a more efficient strategy. So again, our strategy is going to help be to help these clients develop a more optimal internal or that local system of control. So again, we, we have to have different strategies based upon the task that we're asking our clients to do, for example. So we need a different strategy to bend over and lift than we do to lift up overhead. So when we bend forward, we need to be able to have mobility of the pelvis, the hips, and the spine to allow our spine to adjust to get to our body into the right position. However, as soon as we start to engage and lift the child up, we need the ability to keep, keep our spine rigid to, again, protect the spine. So we need to be able to move in between this, these areas of stability and mobility, knowing, knowing when we need to have stability and knowing when to we have mobility and knowing the, and having the right strategy to accomplish each task. So the control of the TPC comes from the nervous system telling the myofascial system what to do and the myofascial system having an effect on the osteoligamentous system or the bony and ligamentous structure and that's what gives us optimal and efficient function. Brain tells the muscles what to do, muscles control the bones and ligament, ligamentous system. So again we have this cohesive system that creates optimal and efficient function. So we also have to think about low level versus high level strategy. And a lot of our clients with low back pain, especially the chronic low back pain, those clients that have had low back pain for years and years, especially those clients that feel tight all the time, they're using a high level or bracing strategy for their low level tasks. So let's talk about low level strategies. Low level strategies are things like, what do you do to control yourself when you're sitting, when you're just quiet standing, when you're bending, when you're walking. So the activities that you do that don't require a lot of force and or effort. We want to be using a low level strategy for that. Meaning we want to use our muscles in a manner that doesn't overtax them or overuse them and they should be relatively relaxed in these positions. Not turned off, but relatively relaxed. However, when we're bracing to lift or bracing to take a punch, for example, when we're lifting, when we're throwing, we need to switch over to a high level strategy. We need to use a lot of more muscular force. Still be efficient, but use a high level force. The problem for our clients comes when they're using a high level strategy, so they're bracing or they're controlling, creating too much rigidity for low level tasks. They're using their muscles too much when they're sitting, when they're standing, when they're bending, or they're walking. And that was my client earlier. Too much 
tone for a simple act of standing or the simple act of standing on one leg or walking. That's why he had so much hypertonicity. That's why he was having so much problems when he was sitting and or walking. Didn't have any problems working out or playing soccer, but he had problems when he was sitting and standing, those low level activities. And most of our clients feel pretty good when they work out because they get the blood flowing, they get the endorphins going, and they start using that high level strategy. But they don't do so well when they start sitting for periods of time or they're standing for periods of time because when they need to use that low level strategy, they're still stuck in that high level bracing strategy. And that's why it's important for many of our clients, it's more important to teach them how to let go and not contract than it is to teach them how to squeeze and brace and contract. And I'll say that again. For many of our clients, it's more important to teach them how to let go or not brace and squeeze than it is to teach them how to squeeze and activate more especially those clients with chronic low back pain. Again, remember, here's my client again. He's using a high level strategy for a low level task. And this is what, this creates inefficiency and that is what's causing our clients to break down and creates that long standing low back pain. Here's another client, professional NFL football player. Again, huge amount of tone, resting tone in his lump thoracic lumbar erectors. Again, you're like, okay, he's a, he's a pretty muscular dude. But what happens, why does he have so much hypertonicity? Check this out, when he goes to do a simple forward bend, a low level task, what happens? He doesn't get much hamstring length, he doesn't get much anterior pelvic tilt at all. And where does most of his motion come? It comes from his lumbar spine. He gets increased flexion in his lumbar spine. So all this tone here, a lot of this tone, is because his body's trying to protect this increased motion here. But the fact that he doesn't have enough motion here at his pelvis or his hips, he doesn't get enough hamstring length to allow him to go into a proper anterior pelvic tilt, necessitates him having to flex excessively from the low back, hence the reason why he's got chronic low back problem. So again, this leads to non-optimal posture, non-optimal stabilization, and then inefficient movement strategies. And that's why this, this football player is quite injured and has chronic low back pain, okay? So now, next we're going to move into dysfunction. Why do our clients develop low back pain? Well, in these poor inefficient strategies. Well, it can come from several areas like trauma. They could have actually a fall, car accident, but that's not really where a lot of our clients' problems come from. Or they could have had surgery that actually shut down muscles, and that's a very common cause of a lot of our clients, especially these, these women that have had C-section, gallbladder surgeries, hysterectomies, and other abdominal surgeries that create scar tissue and inhibition of a deep abdominal system. And we see that so often in our clients that have, have, have had previous abdominal surgeries and even back surgeries, but especially abdominal surgeries, that years later they have these poor strategies or these gripping and hard rigid strategies because of these over gripping type high level strategies for low level tasks. But why do so many of our other clients that haven't had surgeries and maybe haven't had traumas develop problems? Well, think about walking on a slippery surface like a wet tile floor. What's your body's natural reaction? Would you walk with tall, confident strides or would you start to flex, walk a little slower, walk a little bit shorter steps? Well, we know the latter is the response. You're gonna start to, the body will start to compensate, walk slower, walk tighter. So when we think about our body's reaction to an unstable surface or an unstable environment. The body's reaction is to tighten things down. So when you start to hear about chronic low back tightness, chronic tightness in the hips, chronic tightness in the shoulders, what's the body, what's the nervous system really trying to tell us is that we're tr it's trying to develop a more optimal stabilization strategy. And that's why just stretching alone will not help these clients. You have to help them develop a more efficient strategy of control. Teach them how to control better, and a lot of these chronic tightnesses will be relieved. And we said that trauma, of course, surgery, and repetitive trauma, like our children now, and most of us, most of our adult clients, now sit for a living. So that's repetitive trauma. Sitting, remember, creates a posterior pelvic tilt and lumbar spine flexion. So again, we start to overstretch structures in the low back. We overstretch stretch structures in the pelvis and the SI joint, so we start to create this vulnerability of the low back. So that's why our clients often become tight, is because the body's trying to control these areas of, of non-optimal control. So these are reasons that other clients, many of our clients, will have problems as well. 
So what are the body's warning signs when we start to have dysfunction? Well, as we talked about, the first sign is tightness. Tightness is, is your body's first reaction to loss of optimal control. Muscle imbalances is the next thing that we start to see. We start to see these postural alterations. We start to see these muscle imbalances. We start to see these chronic areas of hypertonicity and areas of inhibition. And then eventually, when you've had tightness, muscle imbalances, then we start to, start to develop pain. And once you have pain, then you start creating this repeating, perpetuating cycle. So this leads to compensatory strategies, like my client here standing on one leg. You see the excessive erector tone in her as well as she, as she stands on one leg because she doesn't control that single leg stance very well. Her pelvis and hip kick out, and she has to overuse her erectors to try to develop, and even her shoulder blades to a certain extent, to develop better trunk control. This also leads to breathing dysfunction. Client will over grip their erectors, which will lock down their thorax and lead to breathing dysfunction. Then we develop a loss of control. So again, loss of control leads back to compensatory strategies and compensatory breathing strategies. And again, we develop non-efficient postural and movement strategies. And that's the real reason that our clients are having chronic problems is they're not changing their non-efficient postural and movement strategies. They're not developing better breathing, they're not developing better control, they're not developing those low level strategies for control. So again, what's the myofascial response to dysfunction? As we talked about, the deep myofascial system, that those deeper muscles tend to become inhibited. And that's where we get lots of our muscle imbalances and weaknesses and we lose efficiency. However, we have to compensate. So that's where the superficial myofascial system becomes overactive. It becomes spasm, it goes into muscle garden, and then it, we also have, our clients also develop that problem where they have the inability to relax muscles when they're not needed. So they're overusing those superficial muscles. So, so the non optimal control, injuries in our habits lead to what we call gripper syndromes. And that's what we termed to call these individuals that don't let their muscles go at rest. We can have clients that are abdominal grippers. Again, this is a classic sign of many of us as in the fitness professional as we walk around with our abdominals gripped. This creates rigidity of our trunk, inhibits our breathing optimally through our diaphragm, and it pulls our pelvis into a posterior pelvic tilt and actually flattens out our lumbar spine. So this posture creates some of our low back dysfunction. This client, you can see the C-section scar here. She's also a gripper. You can't see it because of the adipose tissue, but she's also a gripper. You can sort of see the outline of her external obliques grip through here because again, Clients don't want to walk around with, with, a, with a sort of saggy belly after surgery, so they start to over-grip their abdominal wall. So she's also an, an abdominal gripper, and she also has chronic low back pain. Here's my client who's more of a back gripper, and we see many of our clients that are back grippers. They have that thoracolumbar junction hyperextension, so they have a hyperextension here, and they have the hypertonicity of the thoracolumbar erectors, and that's why they always feel like they need to stretch out their low back. And you see they have a splayed wide rib cage, and that real tight back. And then they cannot use their posterior aspect of the diaphragm, so they're not going to get optimal intra-abdominal pressure and control of the low back. And this, these gripper syndromes are often perpetuated by many of the core exercises we give our clients. So if you're an abdominal gripper and, you, and they're doing a lot of crunching or flexion-based exercises, they'll become actually worse because you're going to teach those abdominal muscles to become even more hyperactive. If you're a back gripper and now you're starting to do hyperextension type work, or too many deadlifts or loaded extension type exercises, you're going to also develop problems because you're already overusing these muscles and now these muscles are being called into even more activity. So again, certain exercises will perpetuate dysfunction and that's why there are no best core exercises for every individual. Some clients will do better with flexion exercises, some clients will do better with extension exercises, but the key to most core exercises is we have to teach our clients how to do it more efficiently so they're not overusing their myofascial system to overly compress the spine. Because here's the effect of low back gripping or abdominal gripping. You see both these clients have two different postures but the same representation. Hyperextension at the thoracolumbar junction and flexion or buckling down here at the low back. And this is where this client has low back pain. Extension, rigidity here, flexion here in the lower back. This client here, very similar. Extension at the thoracolumbar junction, his little buckle is a little bit higher, but again, same result. Hyperextension, too much erector tone, and too much flexion or buckling. Again, this client here on the left is a client that sits for a living, and you see that 
posterior pelvic tilt and a lumbar spine flexion. This client over here is a personal trainer. You see the hyperextension, more extension all the way up into his thorax. And he also is in a slight posterior pelvic tilt as well. So again, this is why our clients start to develop problems. In the short term, that's why these clients start to get disc bulges. If you flex the spine or you keep the spine in a flex position, you're going to create disc bulges. If you keep it in, a, in an overloaded position for too long, that's where you start to get these bony changes or these osseous changes, too much bone density. So what we see on x-rays or MRIs are just a result of our client's strategies. And that's why medical doctors that are looking for the cause of pain are missing the big picture because they're looking for the causative factor, but the causative factor is not the disc. The causative factor is not the bone spurs. That's the result of poor strategies. So what we want to do is help our clients develop a better strategy for control. So, recap up to this point. Low back pain is related to an individual strategy. And oftentimes, it's these inefficient or non-optimal strategies that's creating low back pain. Two, low back control or stability is derived by a balance of the deep and superficial myofascial systems. And when the deep system becomes dysfunctional, it generally becomes inhibited. And then the superficial myofascial system becomes overactive to create more control but it often, often results in too much gripping and over compression of our joints. And then we creates a loss of efficiency, which creates compensations, and that's where our clients lead into gripping. They start to grip to try to create control. And the more less control they have, and the more unstable they become, the more they tend to grip. So we need to change the strategy if we want to help our clients get out of this chronic low back pain. And next we're going to go into execution, the corrective exercise solution. It's going to be based upon the principles. Principles are universal laws. They're applicable to everyone. So it doesn't matter if you're working with a 50-year-old desk worker, 20-year-old athlete, or a 75-year-old grandmother that just wants to lift her grandchildren and be more active in her daily life. Principles apply to every single population. Methods are simply ways of accomplishing goals. And that's, this is why your method is less important than the principles. If you apply the principles, then you can use whatever method that you have that's appropriate for your client. So if you like Pilates, if you like yoga, if you like functional training, if you like kettlebells, if you understand and apply the principles, then you can use whatever method you are most comfortable with. As long as you're adhering to the principles and you're applying them appropriately to your clientele. Principles are rooted in child development. So if we look at our, my little niece here when she's three months old, there's certain positions a child goes through and certain developmental patterns they go through to get to the point where they're cute little upright beings running, jumping, going crazy. That's what we base our principles on. They're based upon what do we have to go through through normal development that allows us to be upright and functioning at the most efficient time of our life when we were children. So the supine position, for example, is how the child creates intra-abdominal pressure. And we see the child here with a little happy belly here. And a great position here that we're gonna use also to help our clients with low back pain is to develop optimal alignment. You see the nice open chest position, open shoulders. You see the nice hip centration and the hips are brought up and nice intra-abdominal pressure, nice long spine. This is what we wanna help our clients achieve, get back to the position that we used to do as children. So the benefit of this exercise we call the modified dead bug is it lines up the diaphragms for pressure regulation and it helps to align the neck spine and scapular creates optimal scapular and hip stabilization so it's really a great pattern and one of the fundamental patterns that we use with our clients another pattern we use with our clients is prone lengthening again very similar position but on, on the stomach now we create the base of support over the abdominal region we get the nice long spine position we also get hip centration shoulder centration nice long spine we're able to create intra-abdominal pressure and we get the nice scapular wrapping and a nice long spine position so again we can use these child positions to help develop optimal function in our clients so what are our principles number one is we have to create optimal alignment. Again, the child creates optimal alignment in the different positions it goes through during development. We wanna create optimal alignment in our clients as well. So that allows for joint surfaces to be optimally aligned to support efficient load, loading. Most of our clients that have joint pain, they're loading their joints on, in a non-optimal alignment. So we wanna help our clients get more optimal alignment. We want an alignment where the head is stacked over the thorax and the thorax is stacked over the pelvis. We have good alignment of the spine. We can load the spine without injuring 
the soft tissue and our joint structures. We want to make sure that the rib cage is positioned over top the pelvis, even from the side view, so that the sternum sits over top the pubic symphysis and the ASIS, so that we have good ability to use our intra-abdominal pressure to create the internal stabilization we need to control our spine. We want to make sure that the thorax and pelvis are aligned, so we align up the diaphragms here at the thoracic inlet, the respiratory diaphragm, and the pelvic floor diaphragm. So these three fascial linings are lined up, and now we can control pressure in the thorax, we can control pressure in the abdominal, abdominal and pelvic regions, and now the spine is stabilized and controlled without overcompression. The pelvis should also be neutral. The pelvis is neutral when the ASIS and pubic symphysis are in a nice alignment, and we have a nice lordosis in the lumbar spine. Very few of our clients these days that sit for a living are in a posterior or, or, or most of them are, are in a, a posterior pelvic tilt. Very few of them are actually in an anterior pelvic tilt. So they've lost the neutral alignment of the pelvis, and they've lost the neutral alignment of the lumbar spine. And that's what, another reason why they're getting so much low back pain. So again, we want to be stacked head over top of the trunk, trunk over top of the pelvis. Three common postures that tend to come out of non-optimal control. We have the common upper and lower cross syndrome where the thorax is increased kyphosis, increased lumbar lordosis, and anterior pelvic tilt. We see that very few, very few of our clients have that presentation anymore. More of our clients have what we call sway back, where the pelvis is swayed forward. They're actually in a posterior pelvic tilt. They have flexion in, in the upper lumbar spine or even in the lower lumbar spine. And they also have the forward head and forward shoulders position. They've sort of lost control of that pelvis underneath the thorax. And we also see this in a lot of our active, our very active clientele, especially in a lot of fitness professionals, is they're standing too rigid or too, or what we call military posture. And that's where the thorax is behind, let's see the thorax is behind the pelvis. And again, very rigid posture, doesn't promote proper breathing. And the thorax is behind, so we can't get proper alignment, so we can't develop optimal control, intra-abdominal control. So again, each of these has its own problems, but again, they all come back to loss of efficient control of the thorax over top of the pelvis. And again, we have this problem, we see the upper and lower cross syndrome in my patient here to the left, but here in my patient to the right, we see the exact opposite where she has a, a lord, long lordosis from her upper back all the way down to her pelvis. So again, we have this huge lordosis, and again, this locks up the pelvis, locks up the posterior thorax, and does not allow her to breathe properly, so she cannot develop optimal control of her thorax. And this is a client who had chronic head and neck pain, chronic migraines, and when she learned how to breathe better, she was able to control her migraines and completely get herself off medication. She was taking chronic medication for her migraines, and now she has to take it maybe once or twice a year when her migraines get real bad, but for most of the time, she's able to control her headaches by positioning her body right and breathing properly. And again, here's another client who's got too much abdominal gripping. They pu she's pulled her abdomen in, pulled herself into the posterior pelvic tilt. She also has some posterior hip gripping. So again, flattening out the lumbar spine. Again, chronic lumbar low back pain and radicular pain down her leg. So again, she looks very fit and thin, but she's, she has the classic working out posture. Too much abdominal gripping, posterior pelvic tilt, too much posterior hip gripping. So again, this also relates to a lot of our clients that have low back pain. So the principles of corrective exercise is we want to teach our client next, once we teach them how to align, we want to teach them how to breathe. And it's important that we get that three-dimensional breathing, and we have plenty of videos on our website at Fitness Education Seminars to teach you about proper breathing. We want three-dimensional breathing. We want to make sure the breath gets down into the abdomen. We want the breath to be able to get lateral so that the, the ribcage should expand laterally. And again, that's why it's important to have our client not gripping so they can get that lateral expansion. And we want them also to get that posterior lateral so to breathe down deep into the posterior aspect of the diaphragm. So again, we want three-dimensional breathing. And the client can actually check herself by putting her thumbs in, in her into her, her the sides and, and posterior aspect of her low back, and she breathes in, she should be able to push her thumbs out when she's using her diaphragm appropriately. She should be able to stay long, breathe, and create that three-dimensional expansion of her ribcage. That's how you know she's getting optimal intra-abdominal and intra-thoracic pressure to create optimal spinal and trunk control. Remember, optimal breathing creates not just oxygenation, but it creates optimal stabilization, and that's why breathing is so important. 
not just to create optimal breathing and relaxation, it's to create the optimal stabilization of the trunk over top of the pelvis or the pelvis underneath the trunk. It's really all about pressure regulation and breathing sets up optimal pressure regulation for optimal control. Intra abdominal pressure leads to low back stability. It's one of the most efficient ways of entering the central nervous system, meaning we can help decrease the parasympathetic, or increase the parasympathetic nervous system and decrease the sympathetic nervous system or decrease a lot of that chronic gripping and tone. Improve activation of the deep myofascial system because the diaphragm is myofascially blended into the transverse abdominis, the psoas, the QL. So all these structures are fascially connected internally to create optimal trunk and spinal control. So the last third element of our of developing a more efficient control strategy is control. So we align, we breathe, and now we teach a client how to control so we develop a more efficient posture and movement. So our ABCs align, breathe, control, and we want to integrate these things into the fundamental patterns of squatting, lunging, pushing, pulling, bending, rotating, gait. That's how our clients start to move more efficiently so they get rid of some of their chronic pains, their chronic tightnesses, and move to a more efficient place where they can start to do and live life with more efficiency. So again, we always teach neutral spine. So neutral spine and supine, neutral spine and standing, neutral spine, spine and sideline, so the client understands how to control optimal alignment before they start. Always start with optimal alignment. Then we teach them how to control as they move out of neutral. We want them to be able to move without gripping or squeezing. Sometimes, here, as I'm doing here with my, with my client here, I'm teaching her how to relax the front of her hip, teaching her how to stay long through her spine, maintain activation, the deep activation without over gripping. So if she's bending forward, she can create a proper hip hinge, spinal length, and spinal control. So again, it's about teaching them control. Then take them into their functional progressions. Teach, them, teach a client how to create optimal control of the thorax over top of the pelvis, head in good alignment, whether they're in a TRX plank, a ball plank, or an overhead cable chop plank type pattern. Again, always teach a neutral spine and control when loaded. And again, once you once they learn proper control, then you can load them up with any single pattern you want. Remember, alignment, breathing, control. Once you do that, you can go into all the functional patterns as long as they've demonstrated the ability and earned the right through maintaining optimal alignment, optimal breathing, and optimal control. And then you just go crazy with your exercises as long as your client maintains alignment, breathing, and control. Remember, chronic tightnesses and dysfunction come when our clients lose one or more of those components. They lose either their alignment, they lose their ability to breathe, or they lose their ability to control. And that's why you should not exercise to fatigue. The client should be exercising to point just before they fatigue out because there's very few clients that can maintain optimal alignment and breathing and control when they're fatigued. So three key takeaways. One, the primary cause of low back pain and dysfunction is our client's habits. Yes, surgery plays a role. Yes, trauma plays a role. But it's our client's habits that form the majority of the patterns, set up their patterns for dysfunction. What we want to do is help our clients develop a more efficient strategies using the principles of corrective exercise, alignment, breathing, and control. And then we want to teach them how to align breathing control and progress them into function. That's how we become effective as fitness professionals. That's how we help our clients achieve their functional goals. That's how we become the in-demand expert that our clients need, want, and will refer us to their friends, families, and colleagues. That's how you become the expert that this industry needs, and more importantly, that your clients need. So you feel confident, so you get paid like an expert. So you get paid and respected as every expert and every professional is. If you're looking for further resources, check out our website at Fitness Education Seminars. We just, my wife and I designed this site, created this site for the fitness professional who works mostly with the general population to take you through assessment, corrective exercise, and functional progression. So to teach you how to teach your clients how to move better. We have over 100 free videos and webinars on our site that you have complete access to anytime you want. So feel free to take advantage of these resources because we believe that the fitness professional is a solution to the healthcare crisis that many of our countries are, are experiencing. We are the solution to help our clients move better because if we're not gonna help them move better, then who's gonna help them move better? 
we have to be the solution for our clients. We have to be the answer. We have to be the expert our clients need, want, and will pay for. We're creating a brand new online resource, Integrative Movement U. And again, this is dedicated to those fitness professionals who work with the general population. So you understand the anatomy. So you understand and you can talk intelligently to your client as well as talk intel intelligently to your fellow colleagues, your physical therapist friends, your chiropractor friends, the medical professionals about what's going on with your client. So you understand the biomechanics. What should happen through proper movement? What does proper movement look like? What do biomechanics dictate that we should do to create optimal movement? How do we teach control and corrective exercises? What are the best corrective exercises? What exercises do you want to do with clients? And what exercises do you not want to do with some clients? What goes wrong? So, so once you understand the anatomy, the biomechanics, and control, what actually goes wrong that necessitates the use of corrective exercises? And then also, how do you evaluate and how do you ex execute optimal progressive exercise patterns? So again, the A, B, C, D's, E's of becoming the expert that your clients need and want. I want to thank you for watching this webinar and I hope that it has helped you remain informed so that you can become the expert your clients need and want. If you like this webinar and feel like it can help your colleagues, please, please feel free to pass it on. This is Dr. Evan Osar of Fitness Education Seminars, providing you with the solutions and strategies you need to help your clients perform at their most efficient and optimal level. Take care.